we want to thank you for joining us today. The Our Driving Concern uh, Employer Traffic Safety Program is pleased to be able to offer the webinar until everyone makes it home safe. I want to welcome our presenter this morning, uh, Mr. T.J. Bennett of Shaw Pipeline Services. A few things to note before we get started. Everyone should be muted, but just to be sure, if you would please press uh, star six on your phones to minimize any background noises and to keep any of your conversations uh, that you might have during the webinar confidential. You do have the ability to type questions during the webinar. You also did receive a copy of the presentation uh, to print for note taking. The presenter may answer your questions during the presentation or choose to just address any questions at the end. If you should encounter any problems or issues, just uh, please type a message to let us know. The presenter's contact information will be available on the last slide. There is a very brief post-event survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Because this program is funded through grant dollars and provided at no cost to employers, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. With that, I welcome Mr. Bennett, and we'll turn it over to him to begin. All right. Thanks, Deanna. I am TJ Bennett, also known as TJ the DJ. Uh, that's my second job at JTA Fields Announcing Football. In a little bit of a following there, and we'll see how my voice goes today. One of the things I like about speaking is I absolutely never know what I'm going to say. Uh, as a disclaimer, I have, any, I have a question, a few questions. Are there any lawyers, regulators, competitors, HR representatives, anybody like that on the call? If you are, then uh, uh, please disregard anything I say that you don't like. Uh, another disclaimer, uh, I, I have tried to make all the references to companies and such like that generic. Information presented may not necessarily represent the views of my parent corporation. There's nothing in here except information about past experiences of myself, people I know, things like that. You may hear something that's like, oh, my goodness, that's wonderful. I want to go buy stock in that company. Or you may hear something that's like, oh, no, we've got to sell all our stock. Don't go doing that. There's nothing that you should do. That's not necessarily the exact language that the regulators want, but what I'm saying is this is not a speculative type thing. It's just talking about driving safety programs. So let me give you a little background. Uh, I started worrying about driving back 30 years ago when I was a volunteer with a local fire department in a rural state, in a rural county, in a rural area wouldn't even say a real town. The town had about 13 people in it. And we drove those trucks as fast as they would go. And 100 miles an hour, if they'd go 100, we'd do that. I did that. And there were some worries with that, but we did it anyway. Did a lot of praying, and we were able to get through that. As I got into future or follow-on experiences with the Navy and with uh, – uh, industry outside the Navy. One of the companies I worked with may have known a little bit about government contracts. Being, They may have had some contracts to build stuff for one of those departments that has a bunch of D's in it. And there may have been this executive order that came out a while back that directed that kind of company to have policies against texting and driving. So that was really the first time I was involved with developing a driving safety policy was to meet an executive order that said, thou shalt not allow texting and driving. And uh, so we, we wrote a policy for that and worked in the rollout and the acceptance and all that. And, and uh, so that's where I first got involved with driving safety programs. In uh, 2013, I, uh, I might have switched companies that I worked for and a company that I might know something about had a couple insurance settlements in the range of a whole lot of money, uh, more than seven figures, uh, uh, two of those settlements. The insurance company was not willing to renew the policies without changes. Um, one of those settlements had to do with a fatigue driver, and uh, that uh, that fatigue driver, there's lots of incidents you can look up on the web. This particular one may have been some sort of big heavy truck, like a 5-ton truck, 
that had a driver that had worked a long day, like 17 hours or so, after only three hours off. And he may have had the cruise control set at 65 miles an hour and fallen asleep at the wheel and run through a red light down in a great big state, sort of in the southern part of the United States, and T-boned a car with an innocent third party in it. And uh, that innocent third party may have been left with horrible injuries and eventually, years later, a insurance settlement, like I said, well into the uh, seven, eight figures, came out of that. And believe it or not, uh, insurance companies don't like large settlements. I know that's an amazing revelation, but it is true. So in that period from late 2013 to early 2014, as this company that I may know something about was looking at renewing insurance policy in mid-2014, there was a collaborative effort of safety and risk management representatives throughout that organization, again, one I might have heard about, that met in weekly webinars and conference calls. I heard about this group, uh, or I heard that this group collected and adapted a corporate policy from requirements in various divisional policies within the organization and best practices, primarily those recommended by the insurer. Remember, at this point, the insurance company was the driver behind improvements in driving safety because they don't like large settlements. For my part, I was heavily involved with getting the people in the field to give input. I went around to all of our sites, opened conversations with our people, told them what we were up against, told them what the uh, co-pirates were suggesting in the co-pirate group, opened the floors to ideas from the field, and uh, brought those ideas back to the uh, corporate calls to try to get input and a policy that made sense. So in 2014, there was the first volley, and I apologize, I tried to get this little graphic to actually flip, a, uh, make the uh, catapult flip the phone. So just imagine that, that uh, phone is being flipped there. In the first vol volley that went into effect in early 2014, we had such things as banning all cell phone use while driving. Uh, this company, again, that I may have known something about, had a policy before that required hands-free use of phones, but, uh, again, based largely on insurance and things like that, we decided that that was the time to say no cell phone use, no distractions while driving. We implemented a reverse parking policy. Because uh, someone that's involved with this company, I may have heard something about what used to be employed by one of those big companies with the long names that makes reverse parking a, a hallmark of what they do. There's a lot of research out there to show that you're much less likely to get into a wreck pulling forward out of a parking place or even backing into a parking place than you are backing out of a parking spot. So reverse parking became the policy across the organization and driving record checks began being done for all of our drivers. We, we well, this company I've heard about, had done some driving record checks for drivers off and on. It was part of new hire policy, but driving record checks had not been consistently done every year. So we, um, there was a, a new policy that implemented doing these driving record checks every 12 months for all drivers. And for three years, looking three years in the past, if any of our drivers had a DUI, a suspension for moving violations, three or more moving violations or accidents, things like that, uh, they just weren't allowed to drive until three years had passed, and then only with management review and approval. We got much stronger on our approved driver list, and we started tracking motor vehicle accident history, motor vehicle incident history by driver, and looking at that when we were looking at whether or not to reapprove a driver when we looked at them every year. One thing that uh, that I do with mine, this DUIs and suspension things, if I know about a DUI or a suspension, even if it doesn't show up on the driving record, that excludes them from being a driver for me. And, and 
until that's been resolved. If I know they negotiated a DUI down to an open container or something like that, they're not driving for three years because they did a DUI. If they got a DUI on tribal land or something and it doesn't show up in their state driving record, they don't get to drive for three years. It's uh, I look at the spirit of this, not the letter of the law. And of course, when we formalized the, when we wrote the new policy, we formalized some of the basics: no drinking, drugging, driving, uh, seatbelt use being mandatory. We've got to do maintenance. You know, some some of those oddball things that some folks like to do. And we discussed a lot, but we di didn't formalize fatigue management, defensive driver training use of GPS, IVMS, camera systems, things like that. We did a lot of talk about that, but it wasn't formalized in a company-wide policy in this company I may have heard something about. Some divisions, like mine maybe, uh, started or continued doing those things though. And then there was this, this company, XXX, for years had maintained a GPS system to be able to identify truck locations and alert key personnel to truck alarms because their trucks carry sensitive materials. You know, XXX company may have stuff that's sensitive out there, so we need to know where the trucks are. Because of the driving policy work in late 2013, this XXX company had been working with their GPS company to add the ability to monitor speeding, cornering, braking, acceleration, some of those driving behavior things. Before the GPS company that XXX had chosen was chosen because it allowed the fleet to grow and shrink as the jobs grew and fell, and it allowed XXX to turn off GPS when they weren't being used and not continue to pay for them. That can be a significant expense. So the GPS company that was chosen was one that specialized in, say, used car dealerships that wanted to be able to turn off a ignition if uh, someone didn't make their payments, uh, rental car companies, things like that, that were focused more on where's the car and can we interlock and be able to shut the thing down. Because XXX had sensitive materials in the truck, if the truck alarm went off, they wanted to be able to shut the truck down. So that was the focus before and XXX had been working with the GPS company to add things like speeding and uh, such like that to the, the ability of the company to help us, help them. So in March 2014, an irate civilian called, complaining that one of the XXX box trucks, box trucks ran him off a two-lane road at excessive speed, something like 90 miles an hour on a 55 zone. I never said that, though. Uh, well, I guess I did. It's recorded. GPS showed that XXX did have a truck in that area, and that truck was going at an excessive speed at the time of the complaint. So, XXX started running history on that truck and other trucks, and showed that that truck was going speeds of way too fast, uh, 102 tops, all of those speeds on 55 mile an hour two lane roads out in a rural area where a uh, project was going on. So XXX took some action with GPS information. Um, we've, XXX had just found out after that incident that the GPS provider had turned on the ability to monitor and do reports on speed. So that incident, like the week before, so that incident helped XXX and the GPS company start getting together on using GPS for driving behavior. So what did XXX do? Well, now the company's LMNOP, because XXX is too hard to say. LMNOP began monitoring speeds with the GPS and worked with the GPS company to create alerts, reports, and things like that. LMNOP did an educational outreach to the employees about driving, showed them reports saying, look, this truck here on this job has had, I don't know, 974 hits for speeding and 105 hits going over 90 miles an hour. There's no speed limit around here that's anywhere close to 90, so we got to bring this down. And in addition to speed monitoring, we had, we well, company LMNOP had all of the drivers 
do the National Safety Council online defensive driving training. So what happened, the motor vehicle incidents went from more than 10 a year in 2013 and every year before that to zero at fault, uh, greater than $1,000 damage in incident incidents for over two years. Currently in 2018, there's one on the books, but uh, you know, there were a couple backing into a post or whatever. And those went way down after we standardized, after LMNLP standardized getting backup cameras in the trucks and uh, requiring spotters when there was no backup camera. So anyway, with uh, a lot of emphasis and communication, went from, that's pretty, I'm still pretty amazed at uh, what the guys did out there and gals, going from more than 10 at-fault incidents a year to zero for two years. Then one day, uh, this company, the big corporate umbrella that owned LMNOP, bought another company, and that company had tragedy that struck one evening about 9 p.m. in the spring of 2015. There were three people killed in a fiery wrong-way collision on Highway 385 near Andrews, Texas. Don't bother even trying to Google it, because if you Google that, you'll find that there were probably two or three incidents just like that that happened this week. It's a terrible area for driving. So many people get killed out there. Uh, what happened in this incident, there was a driver of a three-quarter ton truck, three-quarter ton Ford pickup truck, that was going the wrong way on a divided highway. That driver's BAC was greatly above the limit, almost 0.4. Headlights were off and he was going about 80 miles an hour. Uh, I'm gonna say Company Sad's truck was also a three-quarter ton Ford truck with a truck-mounted box in the back that uh, Company Sad did work, had people that would work in when it was parked. It was also going about 80 miles an hour. There was a head-on collision. There were no brake marks on the road. Both trucks burst into flames. The truck behind Sad's truck, there was another truck on the road behind Sad's truck that slammed into the whole mess right after it happened. Everything caught on fire. The driver of the first truck and both occupants of the Sad's truck were killed on the spot. So what did that do? It caused company Sad to revisit driving safety. So over the rest of 2015, there was a new, much more comprehensive fleet management driving safety program developed much more comprehensive. Some elements are still needing to get implemented. We'll talk about that. Some things that were added. Mandatory GPS, IVMS, forward-facing camera for driving behavior across the entire Umbrella Corporation. Detailed training requirements for drivers, not just hit and miss, defensive driving here and there. Expanding operating requirements like having minimum equipment on all the trucks formalizing the vehicle inspection and maintenance, better incident reporting investigation. And there, again, there was talk about fatigue management and even journey management, but there's little stars there because some of that hasn't been implemented yet. This slide here, it's, you all have the slide deck. These are references that were heavily used. Um, this is one I, I was involved from 2013 on with this the OGP 365, the uh, recommended transportation safety practices, NETS, Comprehensive Guide to Road Safety, National Safety Council, those, those were all key uh, uh, sources. There were a lot of big company names that you would recognize, especially in oil and gas that helped us. There were insurance company guidance, there were existing corporate things. There's stuff from the DOT, Federal Motor Carrier so Safety Association, NTS, NTSB, NTSA, Canadian Safety Code, and uh, since then, INGA, the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, has come out with a recommended driving safety policy as well. So all of that I've been involved with for several years. These are all good resources. So guess what? The fatigue management section in this policy never got written. The, so Company Stowe 
you know, that's the company that you owe your soul to. Oh, my soul to the company Stowe. Stowe mobilized crews to field projects around the United States from somewhere in Oklahoma, often with very little notice. So now Stowe tells the crews, okay, we know you, you're supposed to be there in the morning, but take breaks on the way. Even if it means you can't get there on time in the morning, we want you to get there, but get there alive. Don't keep driving through the night and just so that you make your time to show up. Stowe instituted common sense basic work hours fatigue rule. And now company Stowe is involved in an industry much like pipeline construction. So here's what what company Stowe came up with. Let's see if uh, I can get them all up here. So a normal work day is 12 hours or less. A normal work day is actually 10 hours, but a normal work day is up to 12 hours plus no more than four hours driving. That gives eight hours off at a place of residence or temporary residence. An emergency work day is up to 16 hours, including driving, and the supervisor on site can okay that. Anything beyond that requires calling the office, calling the project leaders, and saying, do we really need to do this? Uh, do we need this crew to show up at the yard at 5 a.m. and then sit there until 5 p.m. until stuff is ready. We know they're not going to have stuff ready to do until at least 3 p.m. How about we let them stay off work until 3 and then show up and do stuff? And we aim for one day off each week. We're okay if it's one day off every two weeks. If the uh, seven-day weeks have to last longer, then we do our best to rotate crews so that there's a crew off each weekend and each crew gets at least one day off uh, a month. And that's not enough, but you know that's what we've come up with. And considering what company Stowe does, that the guys do get some rest during the day. They're not busily working and all that. With all this, still, this year, this January, a driver was killed after running into the back of a sand hauler. Again, this was not company Stowe. It was company Sad. The driver was going the fleet speed limit, 70 miles an hour. He was arrested in a recently serviced 2017 Ford F-250 that was inspected before he started driving it. The driver had been trained on the new driving policy. He was not being rushed to get there. He was just heading to a different town to start work the next day. It was uh, just after dusk, so there was a sand hauler that was parked on the road with brake lights on that all functioned as best they could tell, and the company SADS driver had a 30 seconds or more that he could have seen that there was a truck parked there. But the driver ran into the back of the sad sand hauler with no skid marks. The driver probably would have lived, but he was sitting in front of his seat belt that was buckled behind him. And the driver's family reported that he had communicated with them while driving by using social media apps. So we, company sad doesn't know exactly what happened with that, but that's prob he probably was, I can't say he probably was on his phone, but uh, distraction here. So here's the rule of peace. Remember, we spent years working on procedures and policies and paperwork and all that, but I've said this many, many times. Procedures, policies, and paperwork do not prevent problems. People prevent problems. To fix the driving issue, we've got to address the people. Some good stuff has come from all this driving work. Communication with drivers. Most people, when you let them know what you expect, they'll meet those expectations as long as they're reasonable. Like when the company XXX or Elemental P, or I forget which one I called it there, was looking at speed on the GPS things. Uh, let them know, hey, don't don't go 90 miles an hour. Stay under 75. Stay under 70. F folks, uh, follow that. GPS, IVMS, camera systems, they can do a lot more than tell you where your vehicles are. They can identify risky behaviors if you communicate that well. A policy that makes sense using good guidance can really help things out. Talk to your people while developing the policy, though. Don't sit at the desk writing the policy and roll it out to them. Go out and talk to the people and tell them what you think you're going to do and at least let the people feel that they have a voice in what's coming. 
and they'll be more likely to follow it. And then, of course, there's the obvious stuff. Make sure equipment's in good condition, maintained. Drivers are qualified. MVRs is a great thing. And the obvious basics, no distractions, no cell phones, uh, wear seatbelts, no driving under the influence and stuff. And drivers can and must take breaks. I'm already running over, so I'm going to give this a little bit quick. There's still some more challenges ahead. Testing, training, orientation, maintenance, all this stuff. What kind of Frankenstein monster have some of us created with some of our policies? Can we feed that? Even if we do, is that monster going to serve us or turn on us? So just think about that when you're writing policies. Is it something that really adds value and benefit? Is it something that's possible to do? Just think about things like that. Think about also family issues. How will we account for those? You, you can Google a Caterpillar fatigue video. It uh, is linked through a National Safety Council fatigue presentation that uh, is available online. I'm not sure exactly which one, but in that they talk about a strip mine incident where a strip mine huge truck driver ran over a half ton, half ton truck, killing the person in the truck. And that driver, they said, oh, of course we fired him. He was sleeping in the morning safety meeting. He fell asleep at the wheel. Uh, we got to fire him. Well, then they found out that he was working the day after spending the night with his wife in the hospital who was miscarrying their baby. He did not feel that he could step up and say, hey, I just spent all night with my wife miscarrying my baby because they had the attitude of, you get here and you work, and that kind of thing. So think about family issues and how we deal with those. Uh, medications, medical conditions, partying, school, weather, financial issues, drugs, alcohol. There's a million other factors out there. And here's the one. Can my employees come to me when they're not at their best and say, hey, I am too tired. I'm not safe to do whatever the chore is ahead of me today. I'm not safe to drive today. And not beyond that, have I ever told my employees that I want them to do that, that they can do that, and that they're not going to lose their job if they do that? If they make a habit of it, well, we'll talk. But if they're sick, if they're whatever, they need to come to me. Final thought, you've heard it's the economy, stupid, it's the people. When it comes down to it, we put people behind the wheels of our vehicles. Those people are there mostly because they need money for life when they're not at work. Those people in our companies have an obligation to do everything we can to make sure that those people can get home to their lives away from work. And don't forget we have an obligation to protect the public around us. I'm sure you may have heard about the limo crash in New York this weekend. Seventeen people, passengers in the limo, two pedestrians and the driver are dead now. And when, it, when everything comes out, read the NTSB report on that. Go in and Google NTSB reports. I did that a lot in research for this stuff. There's a whole ton of information that can be learned reading these detailed NTSB, Chemical Safety Board, and reports like that. There's a, a whole bunch of information that's available for free out there. And then make a collaborative, honest effort grounded in solid research and recommendations between our companies and our people, I think that's going to have the best chance of meeting that obligation of getting everybody home safe and everybody on the road around them. And with that, I'm going to uh, leave it here. My contact information is on the slide. This is uh, my closing signature and all my emails until everyone makes it home safe. That's what I do as a safety manager. Uh, that's my role. I want to see everybody get home at the end of every day, just like they came to work, and uh, maybe better. So uh, I'm going to ask Deanna. We're right at 11:30. I'm going to ask Deanna if there's questions that I might be able to answer. I can't see questions with the uh, presentation going here. So uh, okay. Deanna, is there, there any that I is there any questions of Mr. Bennett? I, I don't see any questions either. So with that, um, thank you, Mr. Bennett, uh, for such an educating webinar. It was great. Thank you to all who attended. Um, we know your time is very valuable. We hope you gained some very useful information. 
um, and some um, resources that you can uh, gain going forward. Um, and so um, this webinar will be out um, on our website in about a week. Um, and if you would take a quick moment and fill out the post-webinar survey, and then also check our website for future webinars. Um, we um, obviously always try to bring you helpful information in a quick and easy format that you can take back to your organization and start using immediately. And with that, we thank you again, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.